How we doing? We all good? Yeah. Happy days. So, um, so the scripture I read out earlier uh, describes a moment in history where Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, is caught up to heaven. And he sees heaven. And he says something quite interesting. He says that there were words muttered there or uttered there um, that were inexpressible in human language, which is quite interesting. Um, there's other people that have been caught up to heaven as well. Um, in the Bible, um, the people that I've got in mind are people like John, uh, the Apostle John. Uh, he, um, he went up to heaven at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Um, the other person that I've got in mind is, um, is Isaiah, who also saw a vision of heaven. He makes it quite clear that it's a vision of heaven. And so does John. Paul is like, uh, I think I might have gone there in the flesh, but I didn't say I did because I'm not too sure. Um, I was sort of in awe of what was going on. Um, in history, I, I guess there are probably other people outside of scripture that have been to this place called heaven too. Um, and uh, uh, there are times in my own walk as a Christian, um, one I could think of um, that is really clear to me, of a day where I was in a prayer meeting and, uh, and I said to God, I said, uh, I said, listen God, if Moses could see your glory and he was covered in sin, I've been washed of my sin, so I should be able to see your glory too. And so I prayed that prayer and I had this vision. In this vision, I, uh, I would say I may have been uh, caught up to heaven. I may have had a vision of heaven. Not a particularly large and expansive one, but one in a, what seemed to be like a dark room where I saw this cloud of glory, I would call it. Like a really bright cloud. And I thought, wow, it's the glory of God. And I heard this voice say, no, this isn't my glory. Come inside. And so I walked into this cloud and I saw um, what could only be described as a ginormous figure in a morph suit. If you've ever seen a morph suit, they're sort of out of fashion now, uh, but once upon a time people used to wear morph suits everywhere. Um, I, I remember going to, um, what's that place called? Um, Drayton Manor, and people were running around in morph suits thinking they look like Power Rangers, but, but um, tightly more, like slightly more tightly clothed, weirdly. Um, but this figure up in heaven, as I could see in this vision, had, uh, had what I would describe as a black morph suit on, with like golden tassel like rope uh, around his arms and around his legs. And, uh, and all I can say is that I feel like it might have been God in, in his glory, but I don't really know, so I, I wouldn't know what his glory would look like. And the Bible says, if I see it, I die. Um, and, so, um, and so I remember he, uh, he, he said, come and see. And I knelt down in front of him and, and, and I looked at his feet and I prayed, you know, God, don't kill me. I'm going to look at your face. He said, look at my face. And as I started looking up, I got up to his knees and I couldn't look any further. I, I, I was filled with fear. And, uh, and so I woke up and uh, I was in this little prayer room in my workplace and, um, and, I, and I, I just thought, oh, what a wonderful vision. Uh, a massively emotional moment. You know, God answered your prayer, bang on. Uh, there's been other prayers, big prayers that he's answered since then. But um, in this moment in scripture, Paul is talking about a moment where he goes to somewhere that he calls the third heaven. Um, has anyone ever been intrigued by the term the third heaven? Because it's a bit of like a mysterious sort of term, isn't it? Um, has anyone ever read that before and thought, oh, is there different levels of heaven? Uh, if you're a Mormon in the building today, you probably think there's quite a few different levels to heaven and you want to be in the top one. Uh, if you're a Mormon in the building today, let me tell you, you're wrong. Um, uh, 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 and if you're a Mormon watching online as well, you're wrong. Um, the third heaven is not, uh, is not a different level of heaven. Uh, let me tell you the good news. There is only one level of heaven. It's called God's level and everyone is going there. Um, yeah, come on, woo, yes, that's what we want. Us guys that are now followers of Jesus and have chosen to follow him with all of our heart and give him all of our lives, us guys, we're going to that place called heaven. Okay? Now, the, the first heaven that he's talking about is what they what the, the would have believed in those days would be things that you can see, the things around you, like it, almost like um, some, some people would say literally uh, earth itself and creation would be the first heaven. Um, some might say that it was Zion. So a Jewish person might say Zion or Jerusalem is the first heaven, okay? And others might turn around and say, oh, actually, there's this sort of space in between the, uh, the sort of um, earth and the space, like space itself and earth, called the firmament, uh, which is basically the sky. And that would be the first heaven. But essentially, the first heaven is something that you could see. If you could reach out and touch it, you could touch it. Whether it's here on earth or whether it's that bit in the sky, they believe that you could touch it. Okay? 
The second heaven is heaven a bit further away. So when you look up and you see the stars and you think, wow, the stars, they're uh, heaven. They're a different level of heaven. You can't touch them. No way, Jose. They are the second heaven. But you can see it. You can see it with your eyes. And so the people believed in those days that, and some believe even now, if you talk about the first, second, and third heaven, some would say that the second heaven uh, is the stars, okay? The universe that you can see, but you can't touch. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. But you know it's there because you can see it. And then, and then, there's the third heaven. The third heaven is a place beyond perception. The third heaven is a place beyond perception. You can neither see it nor feel it. You can't taste it. You can't even perceive the goodness of what's going to be there. It's so good. The only possible way to describe it might be paradise. God lives there. And if you were a Greek, then the gods live there. (laughs) But in our case, we say the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That's their dwelling place. It's the third heaven, a place beyond perception. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. It's heaven. So in this story, just to make it real clear to you, Paul's not talking about a different level of heaven. He's talking about the heaven. The heaven that we look to, that we hope to. And so in this talk on almost New Year's Eve, I wanted to come to you with some idea of why we should be looking to the third heaven as our destination for 2019. Rather than thinking, oh, I need to do this, this, this and this in my life. I want to give you hope for 2019. Is that okay? Are we up for that? So, what does it mean to hope for 2019? I haven't even opened my notes yet. I don't think I'm even going to need them, to be honest with you. Um, but there's this thing in the, in the New Testament. John, the, uh, the Apostle John, needed to tell these people about the third heaven, or heaven, paradise, where Jesus was and where Jesus was reigning. He needed to tell them about that because there was something happening in those days called persecution. If you were living as a persecuted Christian, uh, Brother Yun... Uh, over in China, was living in persecution. He was a Christian who, uh, who was being beaten and almost killed for his faith. And when you're being beaten, almost killed, when things are always going wrong and it's never quite right for you, um, you at some point need to hope for something beyond perception. Because if it's all about this life now, then when this life is taken, then I'm taken, I'm gone. And so you need to hope for something for something beyond perception. Interestingly, uh, in these uh, communist countries and countries where you're not allowed to have a Christian faith, oftentimes they might let you have a Bible, but they will take the last book out, the book of Revelation, because it talks more about the heaven beyond perception, the heaven beyond life, the heaven beyond this earthly feeling, touchy-feely body of yours. It talks about heaven, a place beyond that. And so if you have faith for what's after your life, then you'll be worried about, uh, you won't be worried about what happens to your life. Whereas if you only think of what's in the carnal, you will be worried about your life forevermore. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. And so the writers of the New Testament, they talk about this third heaven, this place beyond perception, so that you and me can know that whatever happens to my body this week, if I get poorly, if I get sick, if I get poor, and let's face it, we're all a bit poor in here, are we not? If I suddenly go out and mangle my legs and and I can't walk anymore, then don't worry, Dazza, don't worry, because there's a place beyond perception where you will have new legs. The Bible says you will have a new body. You will have a new life. You'll be given fresh impetus, passion, love, life. Pain will be taken away. Sorry, glory zone just there. Gobbing everywhere. Um, can you say I've got a bit of a preach? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> if you get battered this week, then don't worry because Jesus has a place for you where your body will be renewed 100%. You'd be really glad to know that Jesus doesn't just care about your spirit. I think I said this last week in church. He cares about your soul and your body too. The Bible says that 
My soul longs for him, not just my spirit. My spirit needs to be renewed and brought back to life. I need a new spirit. But my soul, that is my, that is my personality, the person of Darren. Jesus cares about Darren as well, my own personality. What's more, he likes me as a person and wants me as a person to go to heaven. So Jesus doesn't just save my spirit, he saves my soul too. And as we go through the book of Revelation, as we go through the book of Corinthians, as we go through those New Testament books... What is made really, really clear is that he cares for your body too. It says he will remove the scars and the past of your body and you will be renewed with a new body, a fresh body, one that still looks like you and, 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 and smells like you, unfortunately, for some of us. Um, <laughs> It, you will be the same as you are in heaven as you are today, just without the scars and without the hurt and pain because all will be washed away. Everything will be washed away. And you'll be given new everything. Jesus cares about your spirit, soul and body. Isn't that good news? So when you're in that place beyond perception, you're not like some weird spiritual gizmo thing that no one really knows what's going on with it. You're, you have a physical body. It's good news, isn't it? And so in the New Testament, uh, certainly in the New Testament, and even today, if you're struggling in your body right now, then be... Filled with hope because you will get a new body that isn't injured and broken when you get to the third heaven. That doesn't mean go and take your life because you want a new body. Okay, so don't go doing that sort of stuff. But what it does mean is, hey, there's good news for you. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take you off to somewhere a lot better than what we're at just now. Isn't that good news? Come on, come on. Um, the second reason, let me get my notes open now because now, uh, now I've started, I better make sure I'm going in the right direction so I can preach on the new heaven all day. Um, here's the thing, the New Testament writers based their, based their lifestyle choices on what was to come rather than what is now. Yeah? So... When they're thinking about a new heaven, a new place to go, a new, uh, a new place where we're going to live in the future, when they think about eternity, they make choices today, not based on tomorrow, but based on after I've gone and died. They base their lifestyle choices on what's to come rather than what they feel just now. At some point during your Christian walk, you've got to give up on the feelings that you feel and not let them control your day, not let them control your life, but let them almost sit to one side and say, I acknowledge my feelings, but they don't, they don't have any effect on what's to come. And so I'm going to base my choices on what's to come. So instead of giving my last two pence when I'm rich in the offering, I'm going to give my full 10%. In fact, if you're anything like me, you want to give more than that because my choices are not based on how good my Adidas are looking. Um, my choices are based on how good my future is looking up in heaven. How good my future is looking up in heaven. So what happens is you start to delay your gratification. So gratification is this thing of I need what I need and I want what I want. I want to feel good right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a choice based on how I feel right now so that I can feel good in 10 minutes time. Actually, your spirit and your soul get battered by that choice and, they, and, and, and you suffer for it when you get to heaven because what happens when you get to heaven is you get told, oh, by the way, all of that stuff you did, all those choices you made, all those things you said and done uh, weren't in line with what God wants for you and so you have a tin shed Whereas old Hazard at the back there has got himself a nice golden palace because he does stuff and makes choices based on what he's going to get in 50, 70 years time. Sorry mate, just shortening your life right there mate. Um, in 70 years time, he makes his choices based on 70 years rather than 10 minutes. How many people struggle with making choices in, for, for 10 minutes time rather than 70 years time? Anyone do that? Yeah, come on, we do, don't we? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, you know what, one more, one more drink um, will make me just go to sleep a little bit easier. Anyone else do that? Yeah, I've done it a few times, you know. I, um, I, I, I'm not going to lie, there's been times even as a Christian where I've gone, if I just have a little bit more wine, at least I'll go to sleep in 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Rather than thinking, oh man, I'm going to be up all night long. 
Yeah, and then what happens is you make some other wrong choices. You text that guy, you message that person who's been doing your editing all day, and you say you've been doing editing all day. And then guess what? Your life turns upside down, and everything turns inside out. Loads of drama comes your way, and you sat there going, "I wish, I wish, I wish I had made a choice for seventy years rather than ten minutes." We all get where I'm at. The New Testament writers based their choices, their lifestyle choices, on where they're going in 70 years rather than where they're going in 10 minutes. And so you should do the same. So number one is that you should live a life, you should live a life that is, that is based on where you're going in the future. Number two, you should live your life as though your body doesn't matter what happens because you're going to get a new one anyway. Yeah? Isn't that good news? Yeah. Yeah, come on. You know, when in the in the in these New Testament stories and stuff, um, there's another reason why these guys uh, are doing this stuff. And I talked about delayed gratification. Yeah, things are going to get better in 70 years' time. But there's also this thing of your treasure in heaven. Your treasure in heaven. Did you know that the Bible says that for everything you do that is aimed towards the Father God, everything that you do is in, that is in His heart rather than your wants and needs, uh, that gets transformed into gold in heaven. And so the Bible says to store up treasure in heaven, not on earth, where moths and locusts and, and all sorts of insects and stuff will eat it. Did you know, and here's the word, your soul is imperishable once you become a Christian. And so these writers are saying, I need to focus my every day on what's to come in the place beyond perception, that place called heaven or paradise or whatever you want to call it, Zion, whatever you want to call it. I must base my choices on that because when I have that, that is imperishable. My body becomes imperishable. My soul, my spirit, imperishable. My gold and my good stuff, my treasure becomes imperishable. Whereas whatever you do today, and let me tell you, if you're any older than 30 like me, then you're already feeling like, oh, my back. Oh, that's definitely not imperishable. It's definitely not imperishable. You are a perishing breed and you will die. But when you put everything into what's beyond perception, when you put everything into making choices for heaven, you will become someone who lives for the imperishable rather than the perishable. Isn't that good news? So you don't get the best job because it's got loads of money because then you can do nicer things with your life. You don't do that. Yeah, you're only as old as what you feel. How old do you feel, bro? How old do you feel? 32. Well, I did well then, didn't I? See that whole 10 years before when I got my on you, mate. <laughs> um, we, we can base our choices, our lifestyle and everything that we have on what is imperishable instead of what is perishable. And you guys have the moment, a, a moment in time to, to think about that. How do I think about what is in heaven? How do I think beyond perception rather than thinking about uh, what is now, what I can perceive to be right now? How do I do that? You ever wondered? Darren says all this stuff up on the stage, but how do I do it? In the morning, you wake up and you think, okay, what am I doing in my life today? Am I thinking Jesus or am I thinking self? Um, am I thinking I want to be an inspirer or am I thinking I just want to get by? Am I thinking I want to I live for Jesus or am I thinking I want to live for myself? For me as a person, and you might go, it's just because you're a pastor. All pastors do that. But no, I wasn't always a pastor. I've been a pastor for five years. Before that, I acted the same. It's because I acted that way that I've ended up being a pastor. And people, weirdly, somehow trust me to come and tell you guys how to live it out. Like, I had it right somehow. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I do have it right all the time. But what I do know is every day, I wake up in the morning, I think about Jesus. I worship him first. I go to sleep. I think about Jesus before I go to sleep and I sleep like a baby I tell you I sleep like a flipping baby I'll go straight to sleep the other day um, I think it was yesterday was it yesterday not yesterday the day before um, we, we, we're sitting in the lounge we'd come back from your house and uh, and and uh, the, the wife stayed downstairs oh, it might have been another day I can't remember it's about 10 o'clock and I went up to, I went up to bed and I've, I've, I've put my head down on the pillow and like Laura's coming about a half hour later and, um, and, and she comes in and she goes 
Apparently, I was, I was already snoring by the time she got up there, you know what I mean? Like, and, and she was shouting down the stairs at Sophie because that's what she always does. And, uh, and she was shouting right outside our bedroom door. And I did not bat an eyelid. I just slept straight through all of that noise. And let me tell you, when it's bedtime, our house gets really noisy because someone likes to squeal and shout and make a noise, don't they, Sophie? Um, but um, our house is super loud. And I just went off like a baby and I just slept and slept. I slept through it all. I remember when I was a kid once, uh, a car came crashing through our front garden and hit a tree right outside our house. And uh, I didn't wake up. Um, but because of all the commotion, my nan came and woke me up and I was like, oh, wow, it's one o'clock in the morning, let's watch Beavis and Butthead. Because uh, I was never allowed up that late normally, you know what I mean? Um, but, but now I'm a Christian, I remember between then and finding Christ, I, I made a right hash of my life. I really did. I, I got it all wrong. I screwed up big time. I, I, did, I made all the wrong choices. And... Um, some of them have turned out all right. My kids are awesome, you know what I mean? But other choices left me without sleep, left me with like a, a body that is scarred, and, and, and I've got flipping, like people ask me about my tattoos, and I'm like, I'm so ashamed of a lot of them. I've had one of them covered up, you know what I mean? But I've got all this stuff on me and in me, and I've got hurt and pain that, that drives me in the wrong way sometimes because of the wrong choices that I made. And in between, uh, in between that moment where I slept through a car crashing and today where I can sleep through anything, you know what I mean? There's this whole lifetime of wrong choices because I didn't have my gaze fixed on heaven. I didn't have my life fixed on above. I chose to follow my own path instead of following his. I didn't even think about it. Most of the time, I remember when I went to uh, Salvation Army when I was a kid, uh, Salvation Army youth group, and I was one of the naughty kids. And you're thinking, wow, really? Yeah, I was. I was the one who wanted to play sardines to cut a field, you know, in the dark. You don't know what I'm on about, do you? It's a, it's a game where all the kids, and they go and hide in a cupboard somewhere, and they have to find each other and hide, and everyone squeezes in together. When I was a kid, I went to Salvation Army just because there were girls there that you could touch up in the cupboards. You know what I mean? That's why I went to that's why, that's why I went to Sunday school. You know what I mean? And and then and then to that, Harry's on laughing. Oh, bless you, Harry. Um, <laughs> it's naughty, isn't it? But that's just what I did. Uh, what? Is it? Uh, well, it, it's before as a Christian, so it's all right. No, it's not all right, but it's like. <laughs> oh wow! I still put it online anyway. It's a good story to tell, isn't it? But no, you're like no, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before I become a Christian, my, my focus, my energy, everything that I thought about was earthly. It's about me getting my needs met. It's about me feeling right. It's about me feeling decent. It's about me feeling like, like I didn't have to need or want anything. I was the guy who went round the shop every morning and, and filled up my bag full of, like, like, well, we used to sell chewing gum at school, so we we got loads of chewing gum, and then we got like mince pies and all that sort of stuff. Not mince pies, the pucker pies. We used to get the pucker pies and lob them all in our bag, and, and like cigarettes and stuff like that, and then and then and then like just rob it. We just rob it and take it to school and sell it all because I could, and because I wanted what I wanted, and that was it. I never thought about heaven, I never thought about that place beyond perception. But today, that's all I think about. And if you're not a Christian today, if you don't always think about that stuff, then let me tell you, you need to start. Because, because if you want a life that is eternal, if you want an imperishable, uh, grand uh, like future ahead of you, then you need to start building up your treasures in heaven rather than getting your needs met today. And that's the truth. That's how we roll. That's what life's about. And you might go, yeah, but... Daz, you're a pastor, so you can do that, you can say that. No, 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 no. I did that before as a pastor. I did that before I even really, like, I did that before I stopped being angry. Yeah? So I was still angry when I was, when I was, like, thinking of Jesus every day. I used to read my Bible for hours every day, and then I'd have a go at the missus for not cooking dinner right. And then another day, I'd, I'd read my Bible all day, and then I'd, I'd have a cigarette, or I'd, like, have, I'd, luckily I stopped, I stopped drinking straight after I got saved. I stopped drinking totally for about 18 months. Went to Bible college and started drinking again. Not a lot every day, but I, I had a beer, you know what I'm saying? But the point is that you may well start focusing your attention on heaven and go, yeah, but my life's still a mess. Yeah, but you're focusing your attention on heaven. Some, at some point, your life's going to stop being a mess. 
At some point, your life's going to stop being filled with drama. At some point, your life's going to stop hurting. But first, but first, focus your attention on what's above and what's beyond perception. Focus your attention on heaven and then your life will start to look right. Don't wait until your life's perfect and pucker before you start thinking about Jesus because it just never will be. I learned how to be a man by reading scripture. I learned how to be a good person by reading scripture. I learned how to be a dad by reading scripture. I learned how to be a husband by reading scripture. I learned how to run a church by, by luck, <laughs> by, by, by reading scripture. Jesus put something in me to preach. I don't know what that's all about. That's just a little gift, I guess. Can't say I learned that. I started doing it one day. And it worked, so I carried on doing it. All this you might think, and people do say it. Ah, oh, this awesome building, this amazing ministry that we're going out, going out in the streets like almost every day and doing amazing things. Ah, oh, Darren, you've done such a great job. You've worked so hard. Yeah, I've worked my, almost had a little swear then. I've worked me bitties off. But that's not why all this has come about. It's because I've been fixed on heaven and heaven only. And Jesus has blessed us. He's blessed all of us. Not because of what I've done. Not because of my drive. Not because of success. Jesus is my success. Having a building, having a worship band, having another pastor on team. All that stuff is just stuff that people think church should have. And sometimes we forget that actually at the centre of it all it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be the imperishable beyond perception. Otherwise we'll lose sight of everything. When this becomes about church and we've lost it. This is all about Jesus. If you want a good life, if you want a healthy life, then you need to start focusing beyond perception. Let's stand, shall we? We're going to have a song in a few moments. Um, Probably that first one, Jesus, you're worthy of it all. And uh, we've had that song on a playlist for some time. And then I just happened to hear a different version of it this week. And I was like, oh, it's so anointed. I feel Jesus when I hear it. So, uh, so I downloaded it, you know, as you do. Um, <laughs> we want that one in church. Um, before we have this song, if you are not a follower of Jesus, then why don't you start 2019 well? Why don't you start it new? Why don't you start it fresh? If you've done it all wrong, then Jesus can put it all right. Yeah. And I want to invite you. Say a prayer with me before, before I do something for the Christians in the room. Say a prayer with me. Say, I want to follow Jesus. Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you know why to follow Jesus? Yeah, you get life beyond perception. You get life in heaven. And the eternity carries on with you in it. That's really good news. And you get to escape hell. Whoa, that's good news. Although some people might think, well, heaven is here, but hell is here also. Who knows hell is on earth as well, right? Yeah, do we not? Yeah, come on. But you might go, I want to escape all of that. And that might be your driving force for accepting Jesus into your life. And that's great. But maybe, just maybe... You're not thinking, I want to escape hell. Instead, you're thinking, I want to enter that place beyond perception. The Bible says, essentially, that you can start living that life now. You don't have to wait. So, why don't you, if you are not a follower of Jesus, pray this prayer with me? It's three simple sentences. We're all going to close our eyes. And once you've said this prayer, if you say amen, then you can become a follower of Jesus as well. Let's all close our eyes, shall we, fam? This is the prayer. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done. Today, I choose to follow you. I choose to focus my attention on the heaven, the third heaven beyond perception. Would you help me to follow you? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
And if you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, then maybe you can go and chat with Pastor Harry later on and just say, hey, I've chosen to become a Christian and uh, he'll sort you out some sort of Bible or something this week, uh, some sort of help to help you start that journey. That'd be amazing. But for the rest of us, um, there's more to this than just inviting new people to become followers of Jesus. Isn't that good news? I thought about Christians too. Yeah, Yeah, come on. We're going to pray together. And maybe... You just need to focus your attention on heaven. So, so I'm going to invite you just to get yourself into a place, a, a, a stance of worship and awe. Almost like, hey, God, I'm, I'm standing here right now thinking, what is this all about? How do I do this? But at the same time, I'm looking to heaven. I'm looking to heaven. I'm reaching out to you, God. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Bless your church. Bless your church. Jesus, we long to walk with you. We long to see you in all of your glory. We want to hear you clearly. We want to see you personally. Yeah, we want to be your best friend, but more than that, we want to be your actual followers. People that put heaven first. And so we pray together. Open our eyes, oh God. Help us to think on heaven. Think on eternity. As a people, as a person, as a group. Have your way in our lives. Move among us. When we take our eyes away from the things above, Give us a shout or a sign or something to help us bring our focus back, God. Help us to be intentional in our walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.